Welcome back to the Meaningful People podcast. We're so happy to see you, even though we <laughs> we're not. Don't, we're literally not seeing them. Don't see you. Yeah, that makes no sense. We're so happy that you're seeing us or you're listening to us right now. We just sat down. They're by Moshe Don Kestenbaum. That's two names, Moshe Don Kestenbaum. That's three names, I guess. <laughs> it was an amazing hour. This is somebody who... He's not going to like me saying this, but I think like he's perfected his Midas, even though I don't know if there's such a thing, but nah, he's he so, definitely didn't perfect his Midas, but he's worked on it. He's, a lot. he's on the journey. He's on the journey. And, nice. and he's all about that self self-impro- self-improvement stuff, right? Yakov? Yeah. And, and, uh, we spoke so much about Midas parenting. He's a Rebbe. In, he was a Rebbe in Waterbury for over 10 years. He, something we didn't even bring up. He, he writes a column in the Yated for a very long time. He has a master's in, uh, Couples and, couples family, and family, family therapy. therapy. He's he's a machaber of two svarim, a book. He wrote Olam Amidas, Olam Havoda, yeah, and, and running after the right covered and the, parent, and the, the heart. heart of parenting. So he's somebody who is very well written and, and very well spoken. I don't well know spoken. how old he is. He's probably a little over forty something. Yeah, but he he when we spoke to him on the phone, we thought like, okay, he's sixty something, seventy something. Yeah, and just by the accomplishments, and then like we met him, we're like, oh, he's younger. he's this young guy who he's written books and sperm by accident, and I think you'll listen to this episode if you know Yaku and I were talking. This episode is for if you're a parent or a child. This episode is for you. Yeah. Now try to figure out what that means for you. Okay. And once again, a big shout out to our sponsor. The people who are powering these episodes, AMR Pharmacy, we're the, so happy to have them on the board. The only pharmacy you'll ever need. Now enjoy them. the rest of this episode. Welcome to the Meaningful People Podcast. The podcast where we talk to people who are... Meaningful. Yeah, that sounds good. Okay, we are here with Rabbi Moshe Don Kessenbaum. Rabbi Moshe Don, that's a very interesting name right over there. Is it two names? Moshe? Moshe. Two names, Moshe okay. Don. What is there? Is there a, a story to that name? So, well, Moshe doesn't need much of a story, but there is a nice story there, which is worth sharing. Um, my parents did not name, give me my name after someone in their family. Actually, a older woman came over to my parents. I have two older brothers. An older woman came over to my parents with a very strange request, bold request, and they said she said that um, she doesn't she didn't have any children and she lost her father and she asked my parents if they would name I don't know if, I think I don't know if it was after I was born probably before I was born she said if you have a boy uh, can you please name your son if you don't have any names can you name your son after my father. And, his, and my parents were not, you know, my father was a, was a rabbi and a mem- she was a member of the shul, but it wasn't like, you know. Your parents they, knew, th- they knew this lady? They, she-, she was a member of the shul. Okay. No, but no uh, special, special connection. My parents were going to actually pick a name um, because they didn't have anyone specific to name after. They were actually going to pick the name Ak- Akiva, hmm. from what I understand. And Rabbi Akiva Kessenbaum doesn't have the same ring. I think this <laughs> no. is good. Moshe Dun- Nahi, there's a Rabbi Akiva Kessenbaum no. who lives in... No, I can't. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> Moshe Dunn works very well because anytime I put Moshe Dunn, people automatically can connect to who it is because yeah. it's an unusual name. So this, this, this father's name was Moshe Dunn? His name was Moshe. Mm-hmm. And my parents really, it's very special of them. They, they, they did it for her. That is, that's very nice. Um, Have you ever maybe visited his... His I did not. Thriller. I don't know his story. It'd be interesting to learn if there's some story in, you know, in connection to my life that I could yeah, find. That, that is interesting. That, that would be interesting. very interesting. And Don is also, was also his name? Don is, I was born on Russia, giving away my birthday here. Uh. Um, not like where fine or I will take birthday gifts, but I was born, <laughs> I was, I was born on Rosh Hashanah. So my, my parents named me Don, Don from Judgment. Wow, that's, that's, that's very that's interesting. Cool. So I, I did a little research about you, and we're going to talk about you. you a little. You. Well, I have to throw in a pet peeve, though, yeah. of mine, since we're oh, there. Oh, okay, let's that go. I once wrote an article about this, that I do believe strongly that if people have the opportunity to name their children after a descendant, you know, after their grandparent, great-grandparent, they should take that opportunity. You know, I understand if it's a name that's very unusual and they feel the child will be embarrassed, but sometimes people will have a nice name, but they like this name better. So, so and, 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 and they like this thing better, but I'm thinking to myself that after 120, do I want my grandkids, great grandkids saying, well, Moshe Dunn, I don't really like that name, so let me, I don't really like Moshe, I like Akiva better. 
you know. All right, so the great great grandkids of Rabbi Moshe Don Kesselbaum, if you're hearing this in 2080, name <laughs> use so, the name. So I think I think it's it's a big zechus for the parents to name their own children after a Bobby a Zaidi. It's, it's, it's you're saying a, no matter like you're saying that whole that whole crew of. The name is weird. The name is out of the box. If it's unusual, I mean, my daughter is, my daughter is named after my grandmother, Allah Shalom. Her name was Yachat. Okay. Yachat is a Yiddish of Yocheved. So Shmuel Kamenetsky said, or Shmuel Kamenetsky said, the, Yiddish varia- the Hebrew variation of a Yiddish name is like naming after the person. Okay. I understand if there's a name. I'm not going to say any names to insult anybody. Right. There's some names that maybe you feel would be harmful for your child. There's like but a Chashlitsky ch- listening right now but, who's feeling but, bad. But a lot of times it's just like it's not my preference. It's not my favorite name. I think parents should consider the fact that you have a chance to kind of honor your parents, kid of aim, because your parents will be happy that a child be named after their parents, their grandparents, their great-great parents. You know, that I, is very interesting. Yeah, yeah that is beautiful. Yeah. I, I, I hear that. So my parents here are named after someone else's father. I think people can consider wow. name, right. name, 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 naming yeah. after their own great great grandparents, etc. So I, I was I was doing some research on you, and I found that for when you went to nursery, you didn't speak <laughs> for during that time, but you did speak at home. I think it's called select mute selective mutism. Maybe? Yeah, it's. Uh, can you tell us about that? Like what? Do you do, remember do you that? Remember not speaking. Well, I, I was a very special child. I had, I had a tinnitus debor <laughs> in nursery. I didn't want to say lush. Well, I don't want to say lush in nursery. Four. I don't know. You have that four. Okay, I have no idea. I have no recollection of why I didn't talk in school. I probably was because I was shy. Mm. So I am more shy by nature, as you could tell. Would you consider yourself an introvert? I am more of an no. introvert for sure. I think that helped me in the in the Musser field being in touch with myself. Wow. You know, extroverts very often, not always, but very often if you're busy with everybody else, you sometimes are not paying attention to your own thoughts and own feelings. So I assume that helped me. Did you, when you were younger, did you imagine that you would be writing Svarim on Midas and stuff like that? When I was younger, not in nursery. <laughs> um, you know, I was zocha to learn by, my Rebbe is Rebbe Per, Rashiva Shifrakwe. Your Plug. Sh- your, your, Nach, your, for those listening, Nach and I also went to Yeshiv for Akwe. We did. All of us not at the same time, though. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, so I sat and learned Musar by my, my Rebbe for three years of base Medish. And I really loved it, enjoyed it, and I took it with me uh, for the, the rest of my life. And you know, I, don't know, I don't know if I thought at that point or years ago I'd write it, you know, not so old, but I thought I'd write a safer. I think at some point... I thought, since I love Musa, I thought maybe when I'm older, you know, maybe right. when, when I'm maybe when I'm very old, I'll write a safer. For those who are listening to this, you're you're not an old person, not, no, people, not at all. People think people when they meet me, if they've never met me before, and they learn to safer, they're they're like, Shh. I remember someone meeting me on Purim, you're like shocked, you thought I was an old man, really? right? Because <laughs> listen, Baruch Hashem, Hashem gave me the gift uh, of writing the safer at a young young age. But uh, you know, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't think I'd write the safer when I did. Um, if you want, I could tell you how that happened, how the safer yeah, came sure. about. Bring up, bring which, us which safer? This is Olamidos. Uh, Olamidos, yeah. So, so basically, my Rebbe taught me to think and to pay attention to to what's going on. Pay attention to myself. Pay attention to your feelings, your anger, your jealousy, your. You know, really pay attention to yourself and try to work on it and try to deal with whatever feelings, whatever thoughts need to be corrected. And, you know, from the time I was 18 or so learning muster by him for the next 10 years or so, I was always, you know, just being aware. Um, when I, I came to Waterbury, Baruch Hashem, it was from the founding Kolo, started the community over there, what Baruch the Hashem. OGs? Yeah, it stands for original oh. gangsters, oh. but that's I, probably not. I, I, that's I, probably I, not so applicable. Uh, yeah. <laughs> that's such an honor. I didn't know that. <laughs> so, uh, but you've been in clinic for way too long not to know that. You for sure knew that. <laughs> I didn't. They didn't teach me that in Waterbury. Yeah, I didn't know that. So <laughs> that, you know, I was in a Rebbe the, many years in Waterbury till this past year, and um, but when I was, I was teaching. Even though I was, you know, I started teaching in the base medish as the base medish grew. I was first in the cold, and I was teaching the base medish. I learned orchus sadikim with the with the bachrim, base medish guys, and you know, I'd use it a little bit as a springboard. Um, I had written nothing down, nothing down. Um, you know, when I was about 28 or so, 29, um, one of the one of the members of the call, his name is Rabshila Zenga, who actually now is becoming a rav in, in Texas. 
so he he came over to me and said, would you give a, once a week, would you give a Musr Vad, Musr Shir to the Kolo guys? So this is the first time I actually was giving a prepared Shir, not just learning the Sefer and talking about what was going, you know, but actually prepared Shir, kind of indepe- so independent. Like put stuff on paper. So I had to put stuff together, and I was yeah. writing down notes, preparing for the, sh- for the Shurim, and I started writing notes, and I started writing, and I started writing, and I started writing. And I started writing well past I needed to prepare for those Sunday Vadim. And I, after a number of pages in, I'm like, I think I have a safer here. <laughs> and then I wrote the next few months. I will admit I cheated a little bit on my Gemara learning and put in a, probably a few hours a day <laughs> writing. In a few months, Bisiata de Shemaya, I wrote the safer. Took another few months to edit my terrible Hebrew. <laughs> uh, it's, not, it's not a small safer. No, Baruch Hashem. For, for those who don't know, what, what, what's a sentence describing what uh, Olam Hamidas is about? Um, you know, the cover of the, of the art school, English version of Olam Hamidas, I think, sums it up. Under, a guide to understanding yourself and refining your character. Mm. So understanding yourself and working on Sounds your... Sounds like my type of book. I wish I read yeah. it before I've, we had this conversation. You, didn't read, you, know, you never Not read. yet. Do you, are you giving out copies? You never, you Daco, copies? You never, we read it together on the phone. You weren't on that conference oh, call. Oh, right. I forgot about that. Uh, what's, they, have, they have downstairs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the what, what's it like being sort of an introvert and being in Chinuch for so many years dealing with high school, Bachram? That's, does that, is that difficult? No, I'm not... You know, I'm not an introvert means like I'm, you know, don't like people or don't uh, <laughs> interact well with people. Uh, Baruch Hashem, I a lot think, of times I you think, see these rah rah loud, loud. Yeah, I know. Yeah, if someone would have said you, you know, if what I would have been the classic, you know, you know, Rebbe and let's say a Waterbury type of yeshiva, which is such a beautiful yeshiva, you would have said no, you know. Um, but I think Baruch Hashem, I interact well with people. I like people. I'm just more of an introvert by nature. I don't need, I don't need to be out there on podcasts and stuff y- like that. Yeah, ex- <laughs> uh, but uh, you know. So I want to I want to delve into your book, or at least what you found about your book. Um, could you tell us more about Midas or just working on oneself? There's a lot of people listening now and are like, "Okay, sign me up. I I want to work on myself." What's What's the intro to that? Um. You know, think a little bit, but really, really, a message I'd want to give over, and every, every everybody really has to, everyone really has to be working on themselves. I don't see how somebody could have a good marriage and raise children, especially today when the children are very difficult, without working on your midos. You know, how do you go about working on your midos? So it may help to 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 to, to get a safer that will help you. Um, whether it's mine, whether it's someone else's, I'm actually learning with my base medish bachram now, right? Per safer, mind over man. But find the safer, you can even listen to sh- Shiurim. Um, my close friend, who I look up to a lot, is Rabbi, Rabbi Daniel Kalish. You can listen to Shiurim. Listen to people. L- l- people have a very um, closed minded view on Musser because maybe when they were in high school, the, the Musser was the some schmooze that. Mm-hmm. They didn't want to listen to the El Shmuz or something that scared them off from Musser. People have a bad, Musser has a bad rap. Hopefully we're, you know, whatever we can to change that. Musser has a bad rap, but the Musser that I got from my Rebbe is so uplifting and so inspiring and, and so much fun to learn about yourself and to see, see, to see your mistakes and to see what you could do better. And you have to work on yourself. So first of all, you know, getting some material could be helpful. You know, Baruch Hashem, people have told me that learning my Sefer has literally change your life. Um, so it helps, apparently it helps, but it's not about reading the Safer. The Safer is really just a springboard into a new look at, at life, a new look at yourself. And then what I tell people is is to pay attention to yourself. I'll be honest, I did not spend a lot of time learning Musser Sarm. I'm not an expert in Musser Sarm. I've learned Masil Sarm a few times, but I'm not an expert in Masil Sarm. I do not have any great Bikiyas in Musser Sarm. My Musser Safer was really myself. So all those flaws you see in my safer, um, I have a connection to those flaws. So you are your own Mr. Safer. You have to be willing to open your eyes and say, I'm getting angry now. Why am I getting so angry? I hear people tell me, I'm so angry at this person. So why, why are you angry? Why are you so angry? Try to understand yourself. Why am I so angry? Why am I getting upset? Am I really getting upset because it's a principle of the matter or am I getting upset because there's something else? 
really, if people open their eyes and want to work on themselves and want to learn about themselves, I think it's there. They will, they will find it. What would you say is like the barometer for if someone has good midas or bad midas? Like, is there a certain person in someone's life that like, okay, if that person says that's that guy or girl is nice, then that means they're, they're nice. How can you tell of someone? Yeah. I don't know. I tell, I tell people, you know, I tell girls in, in Shaduchim, to, to me, the most important thing is someone is working on themselves. You could be naturally a really good person. You could be 90% good. Maybe you're born a nice person, but if you have that 10% that's flawed, and you refuse to budge, that 10% could kill you. Right. And you see people that are generally nice people, you probably met those people, but if they get into some type of fight with you, they can become so dangerous and so nasty, and it destroys them. If I have someone else who maybe is not the nicest person by nature, but he really is an honest person, really wants to work on himself, I put my bets on that person. I think one thing I've seen with people is ability to admit they're wrong, ability to, ability to admit you made a mistake, that to me is a good tell that a person really is sincere and really wants to grow. If you can't admit you made a mistake, then you could really, you really just cover everything over. These are, these are hard, these are hard things to attain, right? It takes a lot of work to, for someone to admit they're wrong, you know, like, you know, when like you're talking to somebody and you're blue in your face, I'm sure in high school this happens, you're sitting at the breakfast table, and you're going on and on and, and then you, you realize like two hours later, you're completely wrong. I want to pat myself on the back over here. <laughs> this this, no, literally yesterday, I'm patting myself on the back. Remember oh, yes. I told you, I thought this interview was happening yesterday. Yaakov texted me, he's like, right, so tonight, I'm like, the, the podcast is t- Tuesday night, not Monday night. And remember I texted you, I'm like, oh, is it tomorrow or Tuesday? And, you're and like, Yaakov's first words he messaged me was, I was wrong, you were right. This is a telltale sign. I'm and a guy. And that's the story must, of our relationship. You must, you must have learned in YFR. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, it's not easy, but, you know, just, just an idea over here. Um, the, the, in, the inability to admit we were wrong, the inability to admit we made a mistake, really comes from a lack of confidence, a lack of being insecure. You know, so... Ironically, if you really value yourself and respect yourself, then being wrong doesn't being affect wrong you. Is, yeah, you know, I, I, I have a word I say with criticism. Someone comes over to you and criticizes you and people run to defend themselves. I try, I'm not perfect, I'm human. It hurts when someone criticizes me. But I try, you know, I call it, um, put my gloves down. I try to put my gloves down and try to listen. Even though it's hurting me, but I try to listen because even if, even if they're wrong, maybe there's something there that needs to be corrected, but let me be a man, take it like a man, take the punches and not run to defend myself. But I have a nice muscle that helps me. I say, imagine you have a car with a lot of scratches and dents and this and that, and then someone comes over to you and says, you know, you see over there on the corner, there's a, there's a scratch there. Say, no, it's not a scratch, it's a style, and you're right, it's a style. But you know, you're, you're even sugar enough, you're getting all crazy that the person's you know, telling you you have a dent in your car when you have hundreds of dents in your car. So why are we going so crazy when someone tells you you did something wrong? Yeah, you know, maybe maybe this time I didn't do something wrong, but but I've done hundreds, of thousands, thousands of things wrong. Why, why am I getting, getting so worked up? People have said once or twice it's happened to me. It's funny. People have you know once or twice someone said to me they were upsetting me for something, and you wrote a Mr. Safer. Oh, and oh I, gosh, that's that deep. And that I said that that hurts. No, I said <laughs> you're. I said you're right. I said it's pretty funny. I wrote a Mr. Safer. I'm not better than anybody else. Hashem gave me a gift. Um, but does, it, does that hurt? No, no, it doesn't. Wow. No. I want to be you right my now. Tra- <laughs> my trans, no, that doesn't hurt me. That, the, the peop- it wasn't like, it wasn't coming from such a great source, but if, uh, you know, but, you know, my uh, people, listen, you know, obviously, you know, Baruch Hashem, people don't usually use it against me. You know, there's a responsibility for it. It must have saved it to at least be somewhat decent, but I tell people I'm a, I'm not perfect. I'm a good preacher. I preach. I tell everyone right. what to do. I preach. and I, I like that you say that because it, it kind of feels like a certain relief that like yeah. coming from someone who wrote a Muster Safer is like, it's okay. People, we're not perfect. We make mistakes. It's and like you burst the bubble before they're even. Like, don't look at me to be perfect at, at, at with me. This, this every, That's the whole so point. I'm a good, I'm a, I say I'm a good preacher. I, people say practice. You know, I think I wrote this in my introduction to the English Safer. I said, people say practice what you preach. I say try to practice what you preach. Right. So... I'm not a complete faker, and I try not to talk about things that I'm just like have no connection to. Mm-hmm. But if I'm if I'm if I'm writing about working on your anger, it doesn't mean I never get angry. It just means I believe it's something we need to work on, and I'm trying to work on it like everybody else. Do you? I see. I've seen a quote uh, passed around a lot. Um, it goes something like, 
don't don't take criticism from someone you wouldn't go to advice go to for advice is that something you would agree with because as much as someone could work hard on not being offended or or are you saying no fuck care like practice being told that you know this isn't good that isn't good take criticism take criticism for anybody i'm not saying it's easy and i'm not saying i could always do it but in the reality take criticism for anybody if you have somebody that let's say doesn't like you you know, maybe someone's jealous of your show and they're criticizing you. Mm-hmm. They may give you some something good to help you. You know, right. why wouldn't we take why wouldn't we take criticism? Why not? If it's true, if it's look listen, if it's true, then there's something to gain from it. If he's wrong, so he's wrong. And and it doesn't mean if someone criticizes you and they're wrong, you can you can't tell them. But like you said, it uncovers a you know, I guess the core of just insecurity and lack of confidence, which is why someone would get upset to begin with. <laughs> Yeah, we, 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 we have like this, we, we kind of fool ourselves into this thinking that we're like perfect people, even though we really know we're not, so it's kind of weird. And then if someone comes and tells us we did something wrong, it's like we're all angry, like they said I did something wrong, but you know, wh- why are we getting so worked up? I, we're getting worked up for two reasons. We're getting worked up because we want the other person to think we're so perfect. And usually getting defensive doesn't help convince them right. that that's the case right. in any case. Yeah, I'm, I'm very impressed. One of the things that impresses me, that's why I said about admitting you're wrong, one of the greatest one of the greatest things is I see, when I see somebody can admit they made a mistake, I'm like, this is a good person. And when I see somebody that clearly is just totally defensive, I'm like, I have a hard time. No, I, try, I think I try to judge people favorably, but I do lo- lose a certain amount of respect for the person when I see that they can't, and man, I once went over to somebody who I thought was, you know, disrespectful to children. And I went over to him. I don't want to give too many details here. But I went over to him and I said, I said, you know, I think you could have, I said it nicely. I said, I think, you know, maybe saying you could have said something a little bit nicer. Person got so mean, so mad at me, so mad at me. And I, and I now, I, you know, I don't have much to do with the person, but it's hard for me now to take the person seriously because you're not an honest person. D- right. I, I hear that. You know what a struggle for me is? And... They say Mashiach is going to come. And when Mashiach is coming, that's Kufa. Older people are going to be like not respected as well. But as you're talking, I and you just mentioned the story of someone older. It, it's Because someone's a certain age, obviously the older someone is, you have to give them covered. But I see it as I'm getting older. Like There's like these 60, 70-year-olds that I'm like, they're just not nice people. And you would think like, come on, you got to be nicer because you're older. I have to look up to you. And it just, it doesn't always go like that. Because if you, do, if you don't work on your this ever, what do you say that? It just, it doesn't come with maturity people, or age. People think, you know, as we get older ourselves, we start to realize it's not true. But people, We're not wine. people <laughs> think, yeah, people think that when you're, you know, older, you know, the age of older always goes up. Right. You know, I yeah. used to, I it's whatever you're not. I used, to think, <laughs> I used to think 40 was old. Now we're, now that I passed 40, I'm what? Like 50s old, 60s old. Yes, 40? You're always, you're always raising the bar. But, you, you think that someone gets older, they're going to be um, all of a sudden more mature. And they're not. The same pettiness. And sometimes you see Nebuch, unfortunately, older people, people that, you know, are not well. And you see, but you see certain immaturity. Um, it doesn't go away without working on it. It doesn't. People fighting about their seat in shul, like, what are they doing? It's a but it doesn't for just. For a lot of people, they hear that. Like, yeah. Fighting for the seat se- in shul, that's, <laughs> you see a lot of that, no? Yeah, I mean, and, and you know, then it's a from a chajbin, you know, makam kavua. I'm right. Like, I'm and like, then it becomes like a, like, it's a, then it becomes a halacha battle, but it really started off in but, pettiness. But, but people that are not, don't work on themselves, could literally be fighting for their makam kavua, and they will say, I'm fighting for makam kavua. See, it's, you want to fight for your seat, fight for your seat. This, this is what, I, this yeah. is my motto. But at least know what you're fighting for. Don't convince yourself that you're fighting for, you know, the guy davens to the Ahmed and the guy goes over to him and says, Tircha di Tzibura. You know, the biggest sin possible is he davened too long. He was too slow. And you were coming defending the people because you're worried about Tircha Tzibura. I realized years ago, you're not worried about Tircha di Tzibura. You're worried about Tircha of yourself. Right. And embarrassing somebody, embarrassing the Gechazin because of Tircha di Tzibura. Whose sin is greater? His sin because you davened a little too long? Or your sin embarrassing the guy? But you're convinced. The guy goes around this whole life, I'm such a good guy. I defend Tircha di Tzibura. I defend this. I defend that. And he's not honest with himself. If you don't learn Musr, I don't see how it's possible you can really understand yourself. And Musr is. Is, um, you're saying it, it, it's not necessarily Muster is not supposed to put you in a depressive state and think you know you're not supposed to think of yourself as maybe someone had an experience with Muster that w- wasn't so great um, but cla- like you said before classic when you're younger I you think hear, a lot of people yeah. associate Muster as like 
you're doing something wrong, got to stop it, and you feel bad for it. That's typically... Yeah, yeah, no, that's not the muster. Again, you know, whatever we call it, the muster that I've been exposed to, the muster that I hope um, Zilcha to bring to others is a muster that tells you how good you are and how great you can become and how you can help others with many of the midos, you know, in, in interactions with others. So my, my mashkiach, Rabbi Stark, um, in our soul, oh, you know? He, he wrote a sefer recently about my favorite topic. Really? Yeah. Midos? I have the sefer, it's the, in the Hebrew. The that he wrote about. Co- uh, co- co- learn it with co- you. Co- covered? Covered, yeah. You also wrote a book about covered. Oh, I'm impressed. I was in Hebrew for He wrote Olam HaKavod, right, yeah. No, no. Olam Amidas. <laughs> no, he also wrote Olam HaKavod. So. I, I, I read the... Okay, <laughs> Olam Ol- Ol- HaKavod is a section in Olam Amidas. Oh, okay. But I wrote a separate a English statement. I, okay. I, was, I was in 10th grade in YFR, and I think someone came over to me. I was in the gym, and he said, it was the end of the year, he's like, here's an amazing book, and he like inscribed it. It was like a base Spanish guy, and it was, I think it was Running After the Right Covered. Was it? Was that you? You didn't write that? You did write I that. Did. You did. That was oh, your book. That was so awkward. <laughs> so <laughs> like, did you write that was Safer Beratius? No, that, was, that, was that wasn't my Never friend mind. Yaakov Hill, was it? It was your friend Yaakov Hill. No Hilla. way. Yaakov well, Hill Goodman. Special person, yeah. But I, you just scared me because <laughs> I was like, I, you're looking with a it's blank. Okay. For people, those who are not watching, you're looking with a blank face. Like, I have no idea what people, you're talking other about. People so could, other people could write good stuff on it. Oh, my God. Run after the right covered. You didn't know he wrote that book. Yeah, yeah, it's on the left. I thought all of my cover, that's why I got confused. Yeah, running after the right cover, that's your favorite run, topic. Run, yeah, so I just had a thought as as Mamish uh, outside uh, before I came in that uh, Chazal tells before Mashiach comes there's going to be a lot of chutzpah, a lot of disrespect. And we see, yeah. uh, you know, the disrespect. So, um, but children today need more respect than others. Than, than ever. Children need a lot of respect. And one of the most important topics to me is kavod, treating your spouse with kavod, treating your children with kavod, treating your talmidim with kavod. I gave a shmuz about that once, and someone came over to me, I, I quoted the mission, Pekei the honor of your students should be dear to you like your own. So someone said, well, you're supposed to stand up for your students? So first of all, it's not a kasha on me, it's a kasha on the Mishnah. <laughs> but the Mishnah doesn't say you should... And the guy got, the guy got upset at you. <laughs> the, Mishnah, the Mishnah doesn't say you should treat him with the same type of kavod, but the Mishnah says you should care about his honor the same way you care about your own honor, to care about the children's feelings. You know, my wife is a fifth grade teacher, phenomenal. She treats the girls with such respect. If a girl may, does something wrong, playing with something in class, she will not... She will try as hard as possible not to call out the kid, not to embarrass the kid. Right. She'll just say, okay, everyone put everything away. Not to call out the kid by name, to put down the child in any way. And the girls respond when their people respond with the truth with respect. But I had a new idea that maybe the reason, the reason why children are chutzpahed today is because they don't feel, they, don't, they, they need a lot of kavod, they need a lot of respect. You know the guy that's always putting people down? Yeah. So I have a good eitzah. Mm-hmm. If you ever have someone that always puts people down, so people get very upset and they have a very hard time giving them honor. So I like to say, give the person honor. Because if he's putting everyone else down, he obviously doesn't feel good about himself. So be, have a little compassion on the guy. And you see the guy in shul is always not nice to everybody. Go make him feel good. Give him a good compliment. By the way, you'll see he'll treat you differently. One of my first years of teaching, I had a, had a student who people told me about before that he's impossible, he's so disrespectful. He was from the nicest students to me I ever had because he felt that I respected him and I liked him. So I was thinking that maybe the reason why children are disrespectful today is because they have such a need for honor. Like, you know, the child that needs to, the baby needs to feed himself. Yeah. So children today are not obedient. They don't just, here, do this, do that. The children are not obedient. But perhaps it comes as well from a need. What children today need, need covered. I don't well, know. When did it change? Like, it's, uh, I, think it's a pr- I think it's progressive. I don't know. The Gemara says before Mashiach comes, Gemara end of sight, the chutzpah yaske, chutzpah is going to increase. People like to say... That's the only explanation. <laughs> so people like to say, some people like to say that the reason why children are disrespectful is because the parents are too soft. So yeah. But, yeah. I, but it's not, my, it's not what, my opinion. As you're saying what you're saying, like a lot of people would argue and say, we need, what do you mean? Does it mean no discipline? That means kids can get away with anything. Like a lot of people respond to a lot of the meaningful minutes. A lot of videos, the one minute videos we send out are not say not fluffy, but they're, they're very much into, you know, you 
You're positive valuable. thinking. Yeah, positive, and... positive thing. And people will be like, yeah, but like, what is that? What is that? That's not real. You have to really. So let me. What do you? What do you? What do you so answer th- to I th- that? I think. I think the main idea. Listen, there are different styles of parenting. How tough you want to be, you know, how soft you want to be, and the different opinions. I am a little bit more liberal in the parenting guidance, but I'm not discuss it right now. But here's one thing that nobody could argue with: do it with respect. So you tell your child, you know, I'm sorry, you cannot go here. You know, you, you could say the same thing in the same way. One of my big pet peeves in yeshiva. You could tell a kid who's not wearing the, the clothing that, you know, clothing, you don't like his clothing. You could tell him, you can't wear that in yeshiva, go home. That's what you could tell him in front of other kids, no less. Or you can call him to your office and say, you know, I know you like clothing, I know it's important to you, but we have a rule in yeshiva and we have to maintain a certain address code. So I, I'm sorry, but this is what we need to do. You could say the same thing and you could discipline your children and discipline your, tell me that my, my wife's a great teacher, she's, she disciplines, but with respect, not to put kids down. Don't put kids down, don't embarrass kids, don't label them negatively. You could do the same things in a nice, respectful way. We'll get back to the episode in just a second. But just a quick message from you from our friends at AMR Pharmacy. They told us after last episode, guys, chill it out a little bit. Too many people are calling. They got too many calls. Too we many did people are too ca- good of a job. Too many people are, are signing up for their services at the pharmacy. So we're just coming on to say, guys, AMR is an okay pharmacy. Yeah, they don't. They don't. And, and you got to hear me in my tone. They don't do an amazing job at delivery and getting to know you really well and having these awesome blister packs. If you have medications every single month and you have to like take it out and use a bottle and it gets confusing. But these packs are awesome and they're so easy to use or they have single packs if you want stuff like that. They don't they have They do that. not. So do us a favor and just like... I don't know. Find a different one? Yeah, find one that's... You know what, Yako? No. Guys, call AMR, okay? They're the only pharmacy that you'll ever need. This is probably the silliest ad people have ever heard. I know. We're a little bit confused, but we're not going to listen to what they said. They are the only pharmacy you'll ever need. You can go ahead and visit amrpharmrx.com. That's A-M-R-P-H-A-R-M-R-X.com. Or you can call 848-222-1110. That's 848-222-1110. AMR Pharmacy. The only pharmacy that doesn't stink. No, I'm kidding. Uh, there's probably some other ones. But they're, <laughs> I'm not kidding. You don't. Once you have them and you use them, if you're New York, New Jersey, you will never need to use another one again. Put it in the bank. They're the people to go to. Give them a call. Go on their website. What exactly Men- should they put in the bank, though? The pharmacy? No, like you have it in your back pocket. Oh, it's, okay. we, we have to we have to worry about too many things these days, okay? Whether it, it's it's paying bills or tuition or dealing with our kids or spouses. With the pharmacy, you don't have to deal with it. They take care of everything for you. Get it done today and you'll be happy for the rest of your life. Easy as that, guys. Now enjoy the rest of the episode. This is coming up like halfway through, but I want to mention that you... And you'll you'll help me clarify it. You have a PhD. I don't have a PhD. Okay, do, what do, do what? Okay, what's just because my initials M, just because yeah. initials MD is uh-huh. not. I'm not. You're talking about PDFs outside. No, 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 it's fine. <laughs> no, what what do you have or almost have? I don't really like. I don't. I don't really. I don't really. Uh, I don't really care to talk about it, um, but uh, because it doesn't mean much to me. Uh, but to be honest, just to be honest, since you brought that up, uh, so a few years ago. You know, I realized that and could use some extra parnasa. You know, being a Rebbe pays great, but if you want to have, uh, you know, an extra BMW, you need a, yeah. you know, you need a, uh, you need a, something else. So I wanted to do some, you know, I like to think maybe I'm wrong that I know a little bit about parenting and working with teenagers. So I figured I'd like to do it, but it's kind of hard to advertise yourself as a Rebbe. It takes, it takes a lot of guts to just say, you know, I'm a Rebbe. You call yourself a life coach, I guess, but I'm a Rebbe and I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start counseling. So I thought I would go for a degree. Um, I'll do a degree online and this way I could have something. So I have a master's in, in marriage and um, family therapy, but I, but, I, but I did not really learn much from school. Nothing against that particular school. I don't think people learn it. I think college is a big scam. I think people <laughs> don't really learn. Anyone I've spoken to that's done different programs felt they didn't really learn much in school. Everything is on the job. Everything's on the job. And I don't know. They're just really stealing people's money, to be honest with you. But <laughs> it's a donation. 
It, it, the whole system is really it's rigged, but it's you can't change it because they have bad leaders. Whoever made up that the system, yeah. the this, this, the college system is terrible because I heard this. I heard this in all in many fields, even fields you'd be surprised that they didn't learn much from school. So I did it, but I only got the masters. And then in order to get license, you need to do hours. Now Baruch Hashem, I'm pretty busy. Right. So the the schooling online I was able to do. I happened to like to write. It was a lot of writing, so I was mm-hmm. able to do it quickly. But but to start doing hours, so you know, I could have found somebody. I did have somebody that maybe signed off the hours, but then then I'm, then I'm like a real scam. So it's one thing when I <laughs> it's one thing when I tell people I use it sometimes. Maybe it's not even right. I tell people because people say, are you, "Are you a therapist?" I say, "Well, I have a master's, if that's worth something to you." But I have a master's, uh, but I'm not licensed. So I, you're not you're not like count, you're not allowed to um, practice as a therapist if you're not licensed. I get in trouble for that. Right. So uh, I could practice, I think, as a, as a rabbi, as clergy, but not as, a, not as a therapist. So so for me to go ahead and get licensed when I know I'm not going to put in the hours learning from somebody because I just don't have the time, you know, and, and, and do the and get someone to sign off on my hours and then study for that test and, and then say I'm a licensed therapist in order that I can bill insurance and, and tell people that I'm a licensed therapist, I just couldn't do it anymore. So... So I have the masters, but I and I still do a little bit of counseling. Now Baruch Hashem got a little busier this year, but what's what's counseling like? What's counseling like? I don't know. But a uh, list of your clients. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so you know, but uh, listen, people call me time. You know, I do some counseling, parenting advice, and different things. You know, but my my learning is not. First of all, it's only a few years ago, so none of my svarim have anything to do with uh, psychology. Or mm-hmm. there is psychology in my svarim, but none, the, the secular world gets no credit from my svarim. <laughs> I did not. I, I did not even read. Noted. I did not read. I did not read all. I did not read any of the, even the good secular books. I did not read these books, so no one should accuse me of that. It's really coming from from learning from Chazal and from my own understanding and from what I learned from my Rebbe. And. You know, and, and any of the parenting things is just from experience. And you so wrote, was, just, I want to clarify, you wrote a book on parenting. Yes. I have it written down over here called Heart of Parenting. Yes. Well, what made you write that book? Well, I, I like to think I know a thing or two about parenting. Well, first of all, you, so, were you a parent yet when you wrote it? I was a parent. Okay, okay, my ch- That makes check. sense. Okay, good. I did get, people did criticize me because my children were not yet teenagers when I wrote the book. Oh, uh, you probably got a lot of that. Like, oh, you just wait, not, right? Not so many. Not so many. Um... Actually, it was Yaakov Hill that defended me and said, but he has, or maybe, I don't know if, if he said or I said it, but he said, well, I have, I have uh, Baruch Shem, a lot of teenagers, all my, all my Talmidim. Right. So I taught, I taught in the, in the Masift and Waterbury for 10 years, and I interacted with a lot of parents, and that's one of the, one of the things you know, I did, I spoke yeah. to parents. So I got to learn firsthand experience about what works, what doesn't work, what kids need. So I share those thoughts in the book. The book is, I wouldn't say the book is a comprehensive work on parenting. I, that's the title, The Heart of Parenting. So I try to give over what I believe is the crux, what's the most important part of parenting, and that is the relationship with your child. You know, to have a good relationship with your child, to understand him, to love him, to respect him. When, when should someone read this book? Before they have a kid, right when they have a kid, when the kid's 10? Like uh, I know some Bachram have read the book, but you could, <laughs> and then use it against their parents, right? Oh, but you gosh. could. These uh, against their obeying. <laughs> uh, uh, but this is a parenting book. I, you, maybe one day, one day we could venture into a chenuch, into a direct chenuch book. Yeah. But the, um, but you can read it anytime. You can read it anytime. And there's no, there's no, um, I don't think there's one exact way to parent. I, by nature, am more of a soft person. What? No way. <laughs> yes. So yeah. I, by nature, am more soft-hearted. I have a hard time saying no to my kids. Right. So that's my nature. So if you, it's, I don't have a problem. And I'm not saying exactly how to parent. But there's certain things that I am saying are, are musts. Must have a relationship with your child. Must understand your child must communicate with your child. There's, there's no ways to around me. That. These all sound like so obvious, but I guess it's one of those things that are obvious, but still people don't really. It's obvious and it's obvious in there. thought. It's a lot. It's a lot harder in practice. And when your kid is not doing, when your kid is not doing what you want him to do. Yeah, how does and your how does and your, teenage, how do you and your teenager yeah. and your teenager is not towing the line, and he's not doing everything you want, and maybe he's you know, doing things you shouldn't be doing, that 
you know, when things I tell parents that are, have difficult children, you know, they shouldn't, they shouldn't feel bad and they shouldn't take the blame. I, I said, maybe the opposite. Maybe you're such special parents that Hashem said you could handle this child. I know parents, I'm not going to say their names, but I know parents that if Hashem gave them a tough child, the kid would be, well, who knows where they'd be. So Hashem gave them the easy child. It's not, the parents will take right. the credit. Some parents are very judgmental, unfortunately. They look at people with struggling kids and they say, oh, their kid's struggling because the parents are not tough enough. The kid's struggling because of this, because of that. they are children from so many homes, wonderful people from all over that have kids that are struggling. Sometimes you see a home with seven, seven children that are easy children. I don't say wonderful, but it's not wonderful. They're all wonderful, but seven children are do doing everything right, and then one child that's really struggling. The, the main thing is you have to really be able to accept and appreciate your child. And, you know, one of the, one of the, par the muscle I like to use for parenting is when you water a plant, you water a seed. You don't try to take an apple seed and turn it into an orange. You have to work with your child, with who he is, and understand that if he's struggling to shiva, he doesn't love learning. So what do you do? Beat him up until he likes learning? You're gonna yell at him, scream at him, understand him, get to get to know him, get to understand him, I, and I, appreciate him. Some of these children yeah. become the the superstars. Some of the children <laughs> that struggle in school become superstars. People, I always want to always want to tell Rosh Yeshivas, you know, this kid that you're being tough on, he could he could have millions of dollars one day, maybe in Kylo too, but he can give millions of dollars one day to give your Yeshiva, which he won't give now because the way you're like people have different talents. School is a cruel place. Not everyone was meant for school. Think about it. A guy's great at business and he does terrible at math and science. The guy's a genius in business. We see this all the time. School measures a small part of your brain. School worked well for me, I'll be honest. I'm a student, I'm a school guy. But I'm not a business guy. I'm not good at business. If they would have business classes in school, I would have failed. It measures such a small part of your brain. School's a cruel place for a lot of people. Are, are there, I, I remember seeing a video once, I don't know, maybe you'll recall who it was. The guy was com, you know, comparing with poker chips about parenting. I don't know if that's a, an approach that you ag agree with or a value system, but you know, he mentioned how you can, you know, every time you compliment, you're giving poker chips. And every time, you know, your, te your te you know, kid goes to school and someone says, hey, ugly, he's losing 5,000 poker chips. What are some of the, you know, you, you, you mentioned some of the musts, but what are some of the must nots? Like as a parent, as a teacher, or, or maybe it's different, you can't do this. You can't do the X, Listen, y, we, we all make mistakes. And sometimes you get angry at your child and you're going to say something you shouldn't have said. I like to tell parents that, Rebeam too. You can apologize. You can apologize. Some people think like, you know, you're not allowed to apologize because I'm the parent or I'm the Rebbe. But I think it's so important we'd apologize. If someone deserves an apology, you should apologize. So you make a mistake and you tell your kid, you know, I was angry. I shouldn't have said that. But I'm telling you, if you don't work on your midos, if you don't work on your midos, then you don't have control over your anger. Not only that, you force your kids to do things. How many times do parents force their kids to do things? Because the what are the neighbors going to say? What are the neighbors going to say if my kid comes to shul without his hand jacket, without this, without that? And you're not even thinking objectively. See, one thing if you realize, well, I know it's best for my kid to leave him alone, but, but I'm worried about the neighbors, so I'm going to choose for the neighbors. So that what happens. Because people don't, are afraid of the neighbors, they convince themselves that, oh, yeah, no, I can't let my kid do this. I can't let that because they're living for your neighbors. Don't live for your neighbors. What's best for your child? What, is, what does my child need? Hashem gave you a child. Here's, here's a, one of the main ideas I want to give over for parents, for Rebbeim. We need patience. Some people are not ready to steig, not ready to grow till they're 18, till they're 21. But we've killed them before they got the chance to choose. We've given them so much negative feedback. You're not this, you're not learning, you're not this, with so much negative information that when they hit 18, when they actually would be ready to grow and steig, we've already killed them. Some people are just not ready to buckle down and just not ready to take things seriously until they're a little bit older. Patience, patience, don't force it, patience. We, we, people live from like zero to 20. People have a long life. Do we know, unfortunately, today, people that are 40 years old, chas and have, and have done bad things, have gone off the derech. There's a long life. We, like, we live from zero to 20. People can change. People can grow. Believe in people. Respect people. And let trust them that they'll get it right. Yeah, you have to help them. And sometimes you have to you know, protect them from themselves. But trust them. It's not you. It's them. Trust them. They will get there. They will be big stuff. That's a meaningful minute right there. <laughs> that was good. Okay. Right before we were talking, we were yeah. and said, he's like, hey, I haven't been on Meaningful Minute yet. I made it. I made it. Wow. Well. I, I heard like, uh, you know, like, and, and we'll get to Tiako, but popcorn. It, every kernel pops at a different time. 
you know? It's, it's so important. But when I always tell parents, I say this all the time, I tell parents, if it was someone else's child, you would do such a much better job. Yeah. Someone else's <laughs> kid, he has long hair, he likes his hair long. Sure, I love you, come. He wakes up late shop this morning, come, come, and Juran Yasuda. Someone else's child, you're so good to because you're not taking it personally. Right. And all of a sudden, it's your child. You think it's your fault, maybe? That's why. Maybe you think it's your fault. Yeah. Maybe you, 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 you get frustrated. You think it's. It's not about you and my own children. I don't think it's, it's not about me. I am there to cheerlead even my Talmidim. I'm there to help. I'm there to support. And it's up to them. And they get the credit, you know, and they get the blame. <laughs> <laughs> it's all them. I saw this uh, concept when I, I went a little to Asia Torah and uh, Eretz Stroll. So I heard this from Rabbi Yom Tov Glazer, and it changed the way I look at everything we're talking about right now. Um, there's two concepts that we mix up very much, and you can tell me if you agree with this, you hate this, you tell me what you think about it. That, And I think it's in line with what you're saying, that with children, with people, with any of our fellow Yidden, there's two things. There's accepting them and approving of them. We always, I mean, he was talking about children, like you always have to accept your children, no matter what. Whether they're doing something against the Torah, it doesn't make a difference. You have to accept them. Approve, that's a whole nother story. I don't approve of that. No, that's not what I want you to do. But accepting, if, if children always feel that acceptance feeling, they'll never fully run away. They'll always feel like they belong to you. Beautiful. I actually think that in my parenting book, it's there's, there? a, there's a piece called acceptance and approval. Did he yeah. take that from you maybe? It could be. Everything good was taken from Talk me. Talk about but, uh, scams. But, uh, but, <laughs> no, I don't know. I, I, but yeah, that concept you is... Because par parents get confused and parents say, well, if I accept the fact that my child is not going to daven, if I accept my child is not going to this, then they're, 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 they're going to think that I approve. Right. I said, your children are not stupid. The, the main idea of chenach is by example. Your children see you get up in the morning. The children see that what's important to you. They know it even maybe hurts you to see they're not diving, they're not learning, they're not doing everything. But as 100%, like you said, I love you, I embrace you, I accept you. It doesn't mean I approve, approve of, of everything you're doing. Children understand so much better than people think. You don't have to say everything. Kids get, kids understand by example. And if you're not living a life that by example they can tell, then then you better work on yourself more than you work on your kids. In your, in your counseling, um, in your work in, with Waterbury, Haltora, some Misfit uh, Shari, Prozder, uh, a lot of high schools there. No, uh, Hey Hey Torah is a base medrash. And that's new Baruch Hashem yes. this year. And then Shari Prozder of the Marinstein. Yes. Right. So... You do, I imagine you do with a lot of teenagers, right? Yes. And do you do you see like maybe a kid who was someone said the wrong thing to him and and it had a long term effect where that kid says, Yeah, when I was in third grade, this was said to me. Or now or my rabbi said this, or my parents said this, and, and it has that long term effect. Just to just to highlight the importance of our midas, our interactions with each other, that things aren't always just brushable. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know if it's so much. You have that once in a while. I don't know if it's so much about the one-time incident. Mm -hmm. I really think that we get enough time. If you're a Rebbe in a classroom, you have a year with those kids. You make a mistake, and maybe you got upset, and you said something not nice to the. Cl you said this class is this, which you shouldn't have said. If the Rebbe comes back the next day, you know I got upset. You say I shouldn't have said it. You guys are wonderful guys. First of all, the kids will respect you more. You have a lot of time with your kids, and you even have enough time with your talmidim to make some mistakes and not be perfect. But they will see what you're about. So, and you have to ask yourself, what am I about? How do I see my students? Do I love them? Do I respect them? Do I see them as good? From the Aleph kid to the Dalit kid, I really see the good here, or I don't. Kids sense what you, parenting as well. Parenting is not so much what you say. I've, had, I've coached parents. Oh, so I should say this. I should say that. Kids could read through you. So if you can't find it in your heart to love your kid for who he is, the children will feel it and they'll be resentful to you because you don't really love them. You don't really respect them. You could say, I love you. It doesn't bother me. And it really does. And they could tell. Children can read you. Children can read the, whether the mower or the Rebbe respects them. And it comes out in subtle ways that you may not know how you're, what you're saying and what's, what your eyes, what's in your eyes, you right. know. But it, it's something that has to, that's why Midos is working on what's inside. Because right. what's inside comes through at the end of the day. Does the same apply to marriages, to relationships, dating? Does it, is it the same stuff or not really? Yeah, it is, it is a lot of it. It is a lot of it. You know, if you have a negative view on your spouse, even if you control yourself, but you look down on your spouse 
it's gonna it's gonna sense come through. It's actually the fir, you know the crown piece I quote of Olam Amidos is this idea that Rav Chaim Vital says that you're measured, your midos are measured by how you treat your wife. We suggest maybe the other way too. A woman's midos are measured by how she treats her husband. And one of the ideas I mentioned is because because you really have to work on your inside. With everybody else, you could be a, you could oh yeah I love you great and you're all Mr. Nice Guy, but at home. Who you really are comes through. What you're really thinking comes through. If you got anger issues, if you have anger issues, it's gonna be very, very hard. It's gonna come out. Your wife, even if you don't say it, your wife, your wife sees you're angry. That's also not a good feeling. You have to really work on yourself that I, not to get angry inside and to see your wife, see your husband, and and everything. You know, I knew I wanted to say this. Everything really, if you talk about Musar, everything really should be most important to you should be how you act in your house. You want to you want to learn Musar? Work on your relationship with your spouse. Work on your relationship with your kids. People are just happy being nice outside the house. With their siblings. It's more important with their siblings, of course, younger people, with your parents. The most important thing is how you treat your family. I don't think you'll find one person that's good to their family and is not a nice person outside the house. But you will find plenty of people, plenty of people that are nice on the outside, they're good to others, and they're not good to their family. Because with others, we want to look good and this and that, and there's all those ulterior motives we don't even realize that are motivating us. You really want to work on yourself, just be, work on how you treat your family. It's so important, your kids, for a kid to grow up in a, in a shalom bias, and the way you treat your kids... It's it's just there's nothing more important than that. It's so funny you say that. My wife calls me out all the time. <laughs> Whenever I'm doing like a status or Instagram story, like I'm putting on a certain persona, and everyone when people come up to me like, oh my gosh, they think I'm a lot more fun than I am. I'm not really that fun. And my wife's you're like, pretty you're not fun. really. You're not. I mean, but she's like, you're not. See, because I'm putting on the persona. But like, she's like, you're not really that fun. And like, it's true though. You're right. There is a certain, you know aspect of at least me and i'm sure a lot of people that you try to impress others but yeah when you get I'm, putting, home, I, I that's put, I'm, I'm putting on a show that i'm a nice person that cares <laughs> to cares to work on yourself and stuff but we we ask right, the, can, the mics are off what do you really think <laughs> <laughs> we ask um a lot of our guests what their favorite mitzvah is but we're going to change that question for you what is your favorite mida my favorite mida i think we touched that my favorite mida is is kavod um that's because you like Hava. Yes, I was, <laughs> was going to say that. Why do you think I'm on the show? Um, I like, I, I definitely like Kavod. I'd like honor. But makes, what it makes me feel good? Well, but what I about think, it? Yeah, I then. think I think the most important thing, most important Mida, I think, especially today, is is Kavod. Like we said, you give your children respect. You treat them well. You believe in them. Give them honest compliments, not fake compliments. You you believe in your children. You believe in your Talmudim. They in turn believe in themselves. You, and you mentioned before uh, also, I'm just cutting you off yeah. a little, but also covered for yourself. You have to have covered for yourself like, too. That's actually where I started from. Uh, you know, in Yeshif Rockway, I really have tremendous Akar Satov to one of my Rebbeim, Rabbi Kalish, Rabbi Daniel Kalish's father, Rabbi Yeshua Kalish. Kalish yeah. In 11th grade, I did not have, uh, Baruch Sham, I was, uh, I was a good student and everything, but I didn't have such great confidence levels. And he mamish made me into like, you know, some, really? yeah, he mamish me, he picked on me, like gave me a lot, a lot of kavod. He liked me and he gave me a lot of kavod and it really built me up. And from there, from 11th grade, I learned the power of giving someone honor or giving someone kavod and it became very important to me. And I worked on myself. I worked on myself, developing my own self-esteem. I think in order to give cover to others, in order to build other people's self-esteem, you really have to have your own self-esteem. So I worked on being more positive, less, you know, you know, less hard on myself, being more positive, seeing the good in myself. And you learn how to develop cover for yourself and develop cover for others. 100%, Yaakov, it's really the, you have to have cover for yourself. It's a very big topic. I think, by the way, you know, uh, another pet peeve of mine is there's a big, you know, screaming and big to-do about technology. But in my opinion, technology is not the biggest problem. The biggest problem is after the person, if a person fell into stuff that he shouldn't have fallen into, that's when the problem starts. And then he says, oh, I'm such a bum, I'm such a bad guy, I did this, I might as well do that. The bigger problem than the actual sin is the, the yish, the feeling bad that happens afterwards. I'm very careful every time I give a schmooze about any of these topics. It has to be done in a certain way where a person, a lot of times, all of a sudden, the Yetzirah is very smart. The Bachar doesn't hear the Rebbe Shmuz when the Rebbe says, Shmir say Nayim, he doesn't listen. But all of a sudden, after he's done something wrong, the, the Shmuz starts playing in his head, you Russia, you're this, you're that. And then he's like, I give up. 
the biggest danger is not the technology itself, it's what happens afterwards. If we will learn just to say, I made a mistake, we're living in tough times, I'm going to come back. I'm going to be more careful. Obviously, we should protect ourselves protect us, ourselves from ourselves. But I'm going to do what I can. I'm going to get up. We don't get depressed. We don't get damned. I'm going to go to Shachos the next day. I'm going to keep on learning. I'm going to fight. We, would, we wouldn't have such a problem. It's such an important topic because so many times people speak technology, technology, technology. And I say, covered, covered, covered. And the technology, when you feel good about yourself, when, do we, when are we most susceptible to the Yitzhara? We're not feeling good about ourselves. That that's when we wow. fall in. It's a whole different. If mindset. we would if we would build people up, then I don't want to look at the schmutz. I don't want when we feel good about ourselves. I don't want to get involved in that stuff. I'm too good for this stuff. So covet is just it's a lifeline of a person. The morale yeah. says the Tamina Rakiva died because they because they didn't get covered to each other. That's giving life to a person, and because they didn't give life to each other, their own lives were taken away. When you give someone else covered, you give them life. So wherever we are. You're in this, you pass someone and say good morning when you're kind to somebody. I was just on a plane and the stewardess moved a few of us from the back to the to first class, first time I ever sat first class. No way. Yeah. As Co- it is, covered. I, there yeah. we go. Yeah. And she, she said, she didn't have to because she could have left us there. She said, I read your book. She said, I always, <laughs> she's, she's very funny. She's like, she's, I always pick out a few nice people and, and bring them to the front. Mm-hmm. Now I think she was just picking the people in the back. But she, but instead of just saying I took people from the back, she said I always take a few nice people and bring them to the front. So impressed here, here this lady, she she knew how to make people feel good. You know, it's such a mitzvah to make someone feel good. Say a compliment, say a kind word to somebody else. It's such a big mitzvah. After 120, a person goes to Shemaim, thousands upon thousands of mitzvahs of giving someone a chizuk. And not only are you giving them chizuk, your mamish can be saving their life. A guy feels good about himself, then he wants to learn the next day, and then he wants to be. It just builds a person. I love that. That is awesome. Something that we also start asking our guests is if you could go back in time or, you know, stay in this time and and spend an hour with someone who's no longer with us, who would you want to spend that hour with? It's a really tough question. My first thought, honestly, was the Chafetz Chaim. Okay. I'm sure that's a common answer, but, but I was thinking about it. Maybe I would choose, I'd probably like to choose Rabbi Shal Salantar. He's the he, he he's the founder. He's the founder yeah. of, the, of the Muslim movement. You know, I like to ask him. You know, to spend an hour and you know, tell me, tell me what I'm doing right with my own Muslim thoughts, what I'm going wrong. You know, what needs to be done in this generation. I think that would be pretty. What would you speak pretty to the, cool. What would you speak to the Chavetz Chaim about? I don't know. I just love hanging. Just to be, <laughs> just, to, just bask, to, to drink a beer just, and just, just chill. <laughs> just to just to bask, just to bask in Sadiqim's presence. I, I feel is, like Lush and Hara and Midas in general anger is like it's like a, it's like the same family it's such a hard battle it's such a hard thing to not speak Lush and Hara it's such a hard thing not to get angry yeah you know one of my things with Lush and Hara is that when it's not that Hashem you know wants us to control ourselves from Lush and Hara really Hashem wants it to be that we don't like we don't enjoy Lush and Hara when someone if someone's talking about your father your mother your brother your sister you don't enjoy it if someone's really making fun of them in a, in a harmful way. You don't find it pleasurable. Chavitz Chaim says, Achil Hashem, when you, get pl- when you speak Lashon because there's no pleasure. And everyone asks, what's the Chavitz Chaim talking about? There's no pleasure? I love Lashon But I think the Chavitz Chaim saying, or at least my shot, is that if there's no, if there shouldn't be pleasure. It's Chil Hashem that you have pleasure. It shouldn't be enjoyable to hear, if you have respect for yourself, you feel good about yourself. So then you don't feel good when other people put down, and you don't even enjoy it. The, the avoda really, of course, we have to control ourselves even if we really do enjoy it. But our goal eventually be to the point should be to the point that I don't enjoy putting someone else down. I don't. I don't enjoy it. It's is not. That, it's, is, that it's atta- not is that attainable? Is it like a? There are times. I'm not saying there are times where I don't enjoy it, but there are definitely times where you know that I, I felt like I felt this is this bothersome. This is not enjoyable. And I think the more you work on your own respect for yourself. The more you work on having respect for others, the more you see like putting people down is just 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 disgusting. As and as we as we wind up, wound up. What, I don't know what I'm saying. As we wind down, um, <laughs> now nah, he's drunk for everyone <laughs> to know. That's alcohol in that cup over there. Yeah, as we as we wind up, wind down. Yeah, um, words don't matter. It's fine. <laughs> on a podcast, we have words and talking. Uh, so I'm bashing him. I'm not giving him proper cover. This is real COVID. Yeah, not for your good. Uh, Oh my gosh! Um, just listen. You can, we can edit this part. I know, no, 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 we're no. keeping this in. <laughs> this is oh. good. This is good for my ego. This is good. This is good. Um, oh, it's great. This happens every podcast, by the way. We just cut it out, but I'm kidding. Um, but let's just being in this conversation. Um, is there anything you would tell somebody listening that says, you know what? 
I want to, you know, put these things into motion to my life. I want to work on my mitas and my, my anger on respect. Is there anything that you would tell them a little bit of advice? Um, I, I'm thinking like, so someone says, okay, I want to start. And the next day they go ahead and make fun of somebody. Then like, okay, I'm done. It's a work in progress. I imagine. Is there some, is there, is there something you could tell somebody that wants to begin that journey of, you know, conquering their How, actions? Yeah, it's a great question. First of all, it reminds me. It reminds me. Take your time. <laughs> reminds me of something I wanted to share that my own my own personal Baruch Hashem, you know, I'm, I'm humbled that Hashem gave me these the gifts, uh, but you know the svarim and everything else. But like I said, I didn't didn't sit down to write the safer. I sat down just working on myself between me and myself. My friend doesn't know I'm angry at him. I'm trying to work on myself, not to me. My friend doesn't know I'm feeling jealous. I'm trying to work on myself. You know, so I think people have to realize that the path to, to, to accomplishment comes from really personal things between you and yourself, between you and Hashem. And then through that, Hashem will give you the opportunity to make a difference. And of course, you'll make a difference in so many ways. You pass someone in the street and you say, good morning, how are you? You already made such a big difference. But first of all, you have to value that just in you yourself, your wife says something you don't like and I'm not going to say anything to her. You have to un- celebrate that and say, wow. Because that's, that's the big stuff. That's a big Kiddush Hashem. Only Hashem sees it. No one else sees it. You have to celebrate those things, first of all, tremendously. And, in, and that's Chos Hashem will give you, you know, uh, outside, of, so to say, external accomplishments. And number two, like we said before, the main thing is that you're on the journey. Am I on the journey? Am I on the path that I'm trying to be a better person? Of course, we make mistakes. I get angry. But uh, 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 am I on that path? So it's not all it, or nothing. It's not all or nothing. And the fa- it's everything is if I'm on the journey. So if you're on the journey and you, and you catch yourself, that's one of the biggest things is you can catch yourself and say, I shouldn't have gotten angry. And then maybe you want to ask yourself, why to get angry? And maybe what I could do next time, not to, not to get so angry. And it's a work in progress. I'm still, you know, I have a yeah. lot of work to do. But you're on the journey. You're on that path. But many, many people are just not on the path. And my, bra- my, my tefillah is that everybody just gets on the path. You don't even have to be reading a safer. Am I on the path of working on myself and becoming a, a better person? For real. Not just for everybody else. I have a lot of internal uh, yeah. thinking that I need to I do know. after this. I know. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, you're getting me excited you guys are, to do that. You guys are amazing. You guys are amazing. Just, just to end off, I mean, uh, thank, thank you for coming in. This is an incredible hour. Really insightful. And I, I definitely would urge the public to go ahead and, and buy your Safer El Mamidas and your book, Running After the Right Covered, and Yaakov's version, Olam Covered, <laughs> which is in <laughs> Olam And, and, and your one day, one What's day. the name of the, your parenting book again? The Heart of Parenting. Yeah. Am I allowed to save another Hebrew safer? Yeah, sure. Uh, it's called yeah. Olam Avoda. Oh, Olam sorry. Avoda. That's what I was thinking of. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's really? Yeah, I promise. I, yeah. Okay. Yeah. You know what? I really feel like, I was going to say, I really feel like this was amazing and we're going to have to have you back on because oh, there's oh, wow. so much, there's so much. You scratch the surface. Yeah. You know, there's so much within, you know, we scratch the surface of, okay, what it's all about, how, how important it is, but there's so many like hows, you know, there's so many how. So much to show. You guys will put up with me. I'll be back. Sure. <laughs> we'll wait for another flight to, you know, Richmond, Virginia or whatever it was. And, and Mr. Shem will have you back on. But thank you so, so much for coming in. Sure. Thanks for having me. Thank you. So we just finished that episode, and Nachi was blown away by Rav Moshe Don Kesemel. Yeah, he was—he's just—he was just someone who's great to sit down and have a conversation with. Um, he does counseling. I'm like, are you going to charge me for this podcast? Because I feel <laughs> like I just got counseled. I know. He makes you think so much about where you're holding. And not, you know what? I, 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 we said this on the podcast about, about the muster movement. Not in a bad way. I mean, I, I think when I growing up, like muster was like a bad thing. And as I got older, and I, I think a lot of people are realizing, like muster is amazing. It's yeah. really working yourself. It's amazing if it's done the way he does yeah. it. Yeah. 100 percent i he has a shout out he wanted us Robert to mention Kessner, after we shut it off he wanted to give a shout out to someone in the middle and we're gonna do it for him yeah big shout out to rabbi moshe don Kessner's nephew Svi levinson How's you're getting a say? shout out special the shout first out. ever shout out on the meaningful people podcast so here it is Svi. here's to you for being a great person something that we that i was thinking of uh, before the podcast is like when people are shidduchim they're always thinking about who they're going to marry what type of person they want the person to be you know attractive in their eyes they want them to be the best person the best person for them right. and it was just so interesting I, I think this happens with midas the more you work on yourself the more you work on your own midas the more 
the person that you're going to be with all of a sudden they become better because little things don't anger you, you right know? And you're seeing things through a different lens literally it's like a new pair of glasses so if this episode had that impact on you that it had on us feel free to comment on this on youtube if you're watching it or to leave a review on by apple podcast or spotify or wherever you listen leave us a five star rating or four three two one whatever you feel nope, and don't leave, leave us four through one only, <laughs> only leave five <laughs> Only five. Only five. I appreciate it. But leave us a review. We love you guys. And get ready for some more surprises coming up. Ciao.